I'll talk about uh, uh, hoofed loops in the NACL for superior meals. This is a project with uh, Charlotte Christensen. Uh, hopefully will be finished soon, but it's not yet published. So, uh, loop is a typical uh, disorder operator. Uh, take a loop in space-time and uh, then set boundary conditions uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the contour such that uh, locally the field strengths has a singularity of, uh, of, of direct monopole type. So um, it is characterized by, uh, since Dirac monopole is basically the billion field, it is characterized by n monopole charges for each of the Cartan generators of the gauge group. Um, and uh, these charges have to be quantized because of the Dirac quantization condition. So it is characterized by n integers. Um, uh, so our interest in this topic uh, is, um, uh, comes from integrability. There are some arguments or there are some reasons to believe that if you consider a straight hoofed line, uh, then it, it uh, first of all doesn't break uh, conformal symmetry of the theory. It preserves also part of supersymmetry. And there are reasons to believe that it preserves integrability. So defines an integrable defect CFT. Um, so the goal is to study this uh, defect CFT and uh, we start with uh, simple mean field calculations. Uh, so what I will talk about is uh, basically uh, either one loop or uh, calculations that are based on um, on uh, localization, uh, and then uh, we will be able to compare them to uh, gauge theory and string theory separately in various limits. So uh, one of the tools that I'll use is as duality, uh, which uh, uh, is believed to be an exact symmetry of n equal four superior mills. So if you uh, invert the coupling, uh, uh, then uh, relation functions are mapped to themselves. And in particular, uh, hoofed loops are related to Wilson loops. And the Wilson loop uh, is also characterized by uh, n integers, which are thinking labels of uh, the representation in which you take the trace. So, um, so basically, these two, two objects are dual one to one another. And it was realized early on that uh, S duality gives us access to strong coupling behavior, to the strong coupling regime of the theory. Um, however, it does not commute with the large and limit that uh, is uh, uh, ubiquitous in holography. So, uh, so when we invert the coupling, the scaling with n, of course, changes. So. The hoofed coupling is, is not, um, well, that the large end limit is not preserved. What is the loop? Uh, let me start again. Hoofed <laughs> 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 loop is, uh, it, it is a disorder operator defined by boundary conditions of uh, the gauge fields. So the gauge fields are prescribed to have a singularity of the monopole type. Uh, at, in the space uh, tangent to the to the loop, to the contour defining the, the, the loop. But it, is it supersymmetric? It is supersymmetric if we also require that the scalar, the scalar has uh, uh, singularity that's um, correlated with the singularity. You consider a billion or not a billion? <laughs> yeah, I'll consider a billion theory. Yes, we are. So this is kind of polykov hoft solution, right? Uh, it, it is young monopole. So it's, it's an abelian solution that's, uh, it's indeed a solution of equations of motion, but it's an abelian solution embedded in an abelian group. Right. But, but you 
will consider non-abelian case. Yes, so the quantum fields are non-abelian. Fluctuations are not restricted, but uh, the starting point is, is, an is, is this solution, which is abelian. Can you write it explicitly as an operator? Like you can do Wilson loop? Uh, not really. It's a disorder operator, so you define it by singularity of, of the fields. Mm. Uh, but it is an operator in a sense, uh, so it uh, you can define correlation functions. It's like a defect in space time, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like a clinical defect, you also cannot really define as operator, but you can. Yes, it, it is mm -hmm. similar to conical mm -hmm. defect in, in gravity. Um, so, um, all right. So let, let's start with perturbation theory. So what we need to do then is to expand around this classical solution. And uh, 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 for instance, if we consider a scalar field in the background of the truth loop, uh, it will have charged components for which the propagator, the inverse propagator, uh, is uh, basically the Hamiltonian of a charged particle interacting with the Wu-Yang monopole, or with the Dirac monopole in some U1 subgroup. So, uh, uh, what, well, we want to diagonalize this, uh, this Hamiltonian, and this is a problem that uh, was solved long ago. There, uh, there's uh, some literature on this, starting from the work by Dirac himself from '31, uh, and uh, it's a very beautiful piece of mathematical physics, which was unfamiliar to me. Um, so I do not assume that it's familiar to you, and will explain in a few slides how it works. So. Here is the Hamiltonian that we want to diagonalize. It is momentum squared, but it's a long momentum, so it doesn't come. It commutes on the field of the magnetic monopole. Uh, but the uh, important <coughs> feature of uh, the Dirac monopole is its spherical symmetry. Right? The magnetic flux is spherically symmetric. So one can define an angular momentum operator. It uh, has the usual form x uh, <coughs> cross p, but there's also an extra term one needs to, to add. This was noticed by Fiertz uh, 80 years ago. And uh, uh, of course, this operator obeys the, the usual SU2 commutation relations. So uh, to, to find the spectrum, we simply start with diagonalizing L squared and Lz. Uh, and uh, they will define some spherical functions uh, that are different from the usual spherical functions because L contains a coupling to the gauge field. So these are usually called monopole harmonics. And it's well relatively easy to construct them explicitly. So uh, well, one can fix the gauge. The uh, gauge potential of the monopole has this form. And it is singular. It has a Dirac string, so um, where if theta is equal to to, to uh, phi, um, then a phi is constant, but uh, the, the circle that defines phi shrinks to zero. So this is not really a, 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 a vector potential, but the field strength, of course, is not singular. Uh, so, um, uh, substitute this uh, field into the definition of Lz, we find that it uh, requires a constant shift compared to, to the usual d phi. So, uh, uh, the eigenfunctions of, uh, of Lz are shifted by the monopole flux compared to the usual um, um, magnetic quantum number. So then, from single validness, uh, this combination should be, uh, should be integer. But on the other hand, from SU2 representation theory, we know that the magnetic quantum number should be half integer. And from these two facts, 
it follows that uh, the uh, magnetic charge, which is B over 2 in my notations, should be half integer. That's the direct condition. Okay, so, um, uh, so the problem, uh, well, there is a nice physics explanation of uh, this um, shift of angular momentum due to Wilczek. Uh, and uh, it is based on, on the picture of uh, uh, the magnetic monopole field being switched off, uh, switched on adi adiabatically. So we start with no monopole and then um, it slowly, uh, the magnetic field slowly increases. But if it's integer, it's uh, not exactly possible. Yes, so you have to bend the rules a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right, but if we allow ourselves non-integer charges in the intermediate times, then, okay, then we find some magnetic field. And of course, if we have a variable magnetic field, then it creates uh, uh, an electric field. And this electric field is, is, uh, goes in the angular direction. So correspondingly, the charged particle rotating in the, in the magnetic field will be accelerated in the angular direction. And if you do a simple computation, you find that the, this acceleration results in a finite increment of the angular momentum, which is just the monopole charge. I think it's written in final lecture. Yeah, I, <laughs> um, I found it in the paper by Wilczek from... No, but, but it is known, it is known that particle moving in the presence of monopole charge change its spin. Exactly. This is what I'm trying to explain. The monopole charge. Because this is this formula. So momentum J changed by... Yes, precisely. That, that, that's, uh, that's what uh, I'm trying to explain. <laughs> So, uh, okay, and um, then if you look at this picture, if the particle was a little bit above the monopole, then its magnetic uh, quantum number would be changed by plus B over 2, and if it was below, then it would be changed by minus B over 2. So the levels of the angular momentum would move upstairs or downstairs depending on where you, where the particle sits, and they will meet uh, to make the speed consistent. If B over 2 is uh, half integer, meaning that B is integer. So again, we find the, the same um, direct quantization condition, but then it also shows that there is uh, some Rearrangement of SU2 representations that goes that uh, goes in between, and that can be traced in more uh, with more mathematical rigor. So if one uh, writes down the equation for the angular part of the spherical function, uh, well, it's uh, it's a relatively simple exercise which was done uh, by Tam in 1931. Uh, and the solution can be written down in terms of uh, uh, Jacobi polynomials. So um, uh, the uh, the way um, so the eigen one can trace what happens to eigenvalues, and uh, if the magnetic field is switched on a little bit, the levels uh, start to move diagonally. This uh, L and M uh, diagram. So um, the, the states with non-negative magnetic quantum number, uh, they move uh, in the south-west uh, direction, and uh, those with, with negative m and with m equals zero, they move in uh, northwest. So until they, so that the structure of SU2 representations is completely destroyed in the middle, uh, but uh, when we uh, reach the point where the magnetic charge is half integer, they again rearrange themselves in the SU2 multiplies. But now one test in, in half integer units, so as Pavel already said, 
the orbital angular momentum is half integer for a monopole of charge one half. So the optimization uh, condition for orbital angular, so the angular momentum in a sense gets fractionalized by the magnetic charge. Okay, so um, oh, mm, returning back to the problem with which we started, um, it's convenient to regard it as a reduction on AD2 process 2. So if you have a defect in space time, uh, then um, natural coordinates uh, and the, the, the theory is conformal. Then natural coordinates associated with this defect are the coordinates on the sphere that surround it, which is two-dimensional, and uh, then the radial coordinate in time combined into the entity space, and there is an overall R squared, which doesn't matter because of conformal symmetry. So uh, if you do a closed reduction on S2, then effectively field theory that we will get will live on two-dimensional entity <coughs> space, uh, and the modes will be labeled by the magnetic quantum numbers uh, uh, by the monopole. So, uh, in particular, if we take uh, a scalar interacting with, with the monopole, then the angular momentum squared is the mass operator in ADS2. And we get an infinite spectrum that, uh, uh, for example, looks like this picture. Uh, so the mag magnetic uh, quantum number starts with the monopole charge and goes in, in, in zero units. Um, so, so, and then this is this is the mass spectrum on, on ADS. Uh, now in ADS, uh, a natural um, quantum number is uh, associated with a massive particle is the dimension of the dual operator. So one can think of um, operators inserted on that hoofed line. And those would be dual to uh, some excitation propagating in the radial direction that we can think of particles in ADS2. So this calculation shows that uh, these particles come in, the, in an infinite series uh, with dimensions given by the monopole charge plus one, plus two, etc. So, okay, then, um, uh, so this shows how to quantize theory in the background of the monopole. But effectively, we have an infinite number of fields on ADS2. Um, with, uh, the spectrum that is defined by the original spectrum of the theory and uh, monopole uh, quantization conditions. And then we can compute correlation functions, for example, of the operators uh, inserted uh, somewhere away from the hoofed line. Uh, so the simplest case would be a single operator. And then, uh, by conformal symmetry, it's characterized by a single number. Uh, so uh, the goal of my talk will be to, to show how to compute this number for various operators. Uh, and uh, that uh, one can either <coughs> look at this number so regard this number as um, coefficient of the one-point function, or vice versa of the coefficient with which an operator appears in the expansion of very small group. So if you do an inversion and look at this loop, which is now circular from far away, uh, then it's natural to expand in, in, um, in local operators, and the coefficients are uh, related to, to the to the set of numbers uh, that appear in the one point function. Which can you clarify which ADS is it? Is which dimension? This is uh, I combine time along the loop in the radial direction. And they are naturally ADS coordinates. It is two. It is two. Um, so um, so at weak coupling uh, we need to compute, uh, well, the leading order will be just um, monopole field substituted for all fields in the operator. <coughs> At one loop, we will need to connect uh, the 
fields by a propagator, which, well, is given by expanding in this ideas two modes. Uh, and uh, uh, a strong coupling, uh, uh, strong coupling, the uh, loop is dual to a D1 brain in ADS. Uh, so, uh, and operators are dual supergravity modes, so we need to uh, understand how supergravity modes couple to, to, uh, uh, to, the, to a D1 brain. Uh, and the crucial point here is that this coupling preserves integrability of string theory in ADS5 crosses 5, which was known since the work of Deckel and Oss. And uh, it's natural to expect that uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that quantum integrability will also not be preserved. And so this uh, setup will define an integrable system uh, of uh, that's uh, a boundary version of um, the usual ideas integrability. Okay, so what can we um, calculate in this setup? So the simplest um, observables are uh, well, uh, the simplest observable is the expectation the value of that hoofed loop itself, and here we can use. Um, this duality to uh, related to the Tooft loop, sorry, to the Wilson loop. So the Wilson loop can be uh, calculated exactly using localization. Uh, there is an exact formula in terms of uh, Laguerre polynomials. And, uh, at large end, it becomes a Bessel function, which exponentiates its strong coupling, and one can match this exponent to the action of the uh, uh, Classical string can be as well. So it is important to understand here that uh, this large end result is insufficient to understand what happens to the truth loop. We need to, to, to have this exact expression at finite end. Because, because as duality, uh, uh, it mixes up. Uh, different orders of large n expansion. And so we need to start with something that is, uh, captures uh, all orders in, in 1 over n. So here it is possible to do because we know the exact answer. And then we can take the large n limit after doing as duality. And the picture completely changes. So that hoofed loop exponentiates uh, at any lambda. Uh, just once we take the large n limit, uh, it is exponential in n with the prefactor that is a, uh, is a function of the two coupling that one can um, exactly calculate. And in particular, I can reproduce the picture of classical action over direct uh, monopole. So this um, <coughs> function starts with one over lambda term, which is the classical action plus correction that's logarithmic in lambda and that corresponds to zero modes around the monopole, uh, plus the whole series of quantum corrections. In strong coupling, uh, the action goes to zero is one over square root of lambda, and uh, uh, it reproduces what we expect from string theory because uh, the action of, uh, so the tension of the deep brain is proportional to n, and inversely proportional to the square root of lambda. So everything, uh, again, matches. Uh, and one can also compute correlation functions of uh, the full loop with local operators. Uh, uh, so uh, if one starts with the uh, known expression for the Wilson loop, uh, which uh, is given by sum of uh, uh, Laguerre polynomials. Again, this, uh, uh, this expression, if you take the larger limit, it will give an answer that's consistent with, with uh, what we know about Wilson loops, but uh, it is necessary to start with this expression to, to get the right answer for the You cannot first take the large n limit and then apply as duality. Uh, it, uh, as duality has to be applied uh, 
to the exact expression at finite n. Uh, and then was, uh, yes. uh, what happens to the single trace operator on this duality? Does it map to itself? This is a conjecture that, uh, <coughs> that mm -hmm. I don't know a simple explanation, but uh, it is conjectured that the uh, S duality doesn't change the spectrum of local operators. But maybe it maps to some other, oh. yeah, but it, yeah, so it would but be a trace of some other scalar field maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, S duality well, is, is a conjecture, so it is not known how it acts on integration variables. <coughs> uh, but um, well, yeah, okay. so people people somehow assume that uh, uh, local operators map to themselves without any linear transformation or anything like that. Uh, whereas uh, non-local objects map to, to different non-local objects, in particular Wilson loop maps to Hooft loop. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's part of the game that um, we were able to exp very explicitly check. So one can take the large limit of this expression, which is just the exact result. Uh, so this exact result is used. What, what I have said about local operators. Uh, so it's a simple exercise to, to take the large limit of it. And we get some function for the <coughs> So, um, well, it can be written very explicitly. Uh, and uh, at this point, it's convenient to. Uh, to change variables a little bit. So in particular, if one introduces Zhukovsky variables, which are very familiar. <coughs> uh, uh, those of you who do this safety integrability. Uh, so in terms of Zhukovsky variables, the answer looks super simple. So one needs to fix the argument, so the u variable in Zhukovsky plane to be 1 over 2. Uh, and then, uh, for the operator of um, charge L, the answer is x to the L minus 1 over x to the L. Yes? So you have expression which you move uh, first uh, z z in the box, which will square roots. Yes. Uh, then if I will change the branch for the square root, it seems like this C will change sign. Um, for example, square root of lambda. So if I will go for square root of lambda to change sign for square root of lambda, the expression will change sign. Uh, yes, indeed. So, what was the meaning of that? Uh, Normally, you, if you have expression, it shouldn't really depend on which branch you're choosing. Well, I mean, we assume that lambda is positive. If you. No, but it, it, it's, it, it's, is it large here, lambda, or is it arbitrary? Sorry? Lambda in this expression is arbitrary. Arbitrary. Then it should, be, it should depend on which branch you're choosing. Well, it's not analytic in lambda. That's, that's the, the upshot. It's not analytic in lambda, it has a branch cut. If yeah. you go around, then, then, you get, uh, then it changes time, as you said. It means that if you have two series, more or less, imagine you have two series which have the same lambda. <coughs> yes. Somehow uh, you're saying that it's not sufficient to specify the lambda in the series, to specify which square root, which branch of square root of lambda you take and distinguish. No, it's algebraic square root, so we assume that <coughs> to go to negative lambda, you need to. I mean, the theory doesn't make sense of negative one. It's G squared being negative. So lambda is literally positive. Uh, and, uh, but the fact that it has a branch cut starting at zero is, uh, well, it's just a fact of life. <laughs> uh, it doesn't happen for, uh, it doesn't happen for other observables that typically have a branch cut Find a distance um, from the origin, but uh, um, yes, that's true. That it is uh, well, and nevertheless, this has a nice. What should I say? It has a well-defined perturbative expansion in, in lambda. 
I'll talk about it in, in a sec. Is the singularity the same uh, that you, you get uh, in, uh, in n equals 4? There is a singularity at g squared equals minus 1 over 16. Yeah, so this singularity is, in a sense, is present here because the square root then. Yeah. So this, um, this singularity is always there. And uh, I guess it has the same origin that perturbative series have finite radius of convergence, exactly equal to pi squared. Mm -hmm. Can you remind me, what is L? L uh, is uh, the length of the operator. We consider operator trace z to the L, where z is a scalar, complex scalar field from n equals 4 supermultiplied. So it's the dimension of the operator. So PPS operator. And where is the magnetic charge here? <coughs> magnetic charge here is set to one, so uh, uh, one half. I forgot to say this, but most of what I will do is for the basic twofth loop, the smallest possible charge developed uh, by, by um, uh, twofth quantization condition. And I don't know how this formula will look for magnetic charges, but it's an interesting question. Can, do you have a physical interpretation? What kind of operator do you study? So I have a monopole. I choose a DS metric, right? And then what do I study? You know, it's, it's a line of a monopole, mm -hmm. the trajectory of a monopole, mm -hmm. with an operator that, I mean, I study what? a response of, of the... What is this operator? <laughs> scalar operator. What is scalar? Some, some. So you have a monopole, do you have a particle flying around? What, what, what fields? Do you, do you have in mind? And it's, uh, it's uh, just a correlation function of an operator that's scalar field to the raised to the power L. Scalar field? Which scalar field? Uh, so, mono, mono, monopole, it's, electromag it's, electro it's magnetic field. Right? Which well, scalar field? Well, do you consider particles? The scalar particles that, um, in, in the presence of the monopole? What, what? Uh, so the monopole also has, first of all, these particles are charged. So they respond uh, to the monopole by the charge, but also the um, uh, field of the monopole also c contains scalar condensate in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. of supersymmetry. So it's not just. Yeah, Higgs, Higgs field. Yes, yeah. it's called. Yeah. Usually, monopole context is called Higgs field. So, yes. is this is this Higgs field? This is Higgs field. Yes. To the power. To the power L. What is called Z? I mean, it's uh, called Z because the, 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 the <laughs> 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 like maybe you go with your talk because the time is limited. Uh, How limited, by the way? Uh, you still have uh, 20 minutes. Oh, okay. I, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I want to stress here a similarity to a, to a setup uh, where instead of a monopole, we have a domain wall. And uh, this D1, D1, D5 defect CFT, and it, it was solved. So there is a solution that was found by uh, Komatsu and Wong and um, by Zoli and, uh, and uh, Gombar. Uh, and uh, part of the solution is an expression for, for the protected operators, which is uh, substantially more complicated. It has uh, so uh, it depends on x a uh, <coughs> going from one to the charge of the domain wall, and uh, in integrability that, that uh, is associated with the fact that uh, magnons on the string can form bound states with the, the domain wall. So this setup should be much simpler. Uh, there should be no uh, bound states. And what we expect is that this term will correspond to the asymptotic beta ansatz for an empty state. 
and uh, this would be a wrapping correction. How do you know there are no bound states? Uh, well, just by analogy, because uh, in the case of the uh, domain wall, there are exactly three bound states. Yeah. Three. So this would be a polynomial uh, that would depend on. So roughly speak, speaking, it will be a sum of x a raised to the power l, where a goes from 1 to k. And, um, well, it's also, I mean, once we go in the Zhukovsky plane, in the, uh, in the engineer part of the Zhukovsky variable, uh, that corresponds to the bound states of uh, magnets. It's, um, well, you can think of this as, as um, your imaginary momentum, which means that the, the function is, is, uh, is bounded. And uh, naturally, the uh, 1 over 2 corresponds to the, to the lowest possible bound state you have. OK, so uh, let me now. Um, show how, how this answer fits with what we know from perturbation theory and from string theory. <coughs> so perturbation theory, well, we just, at the leading order, we just substitute classical field for classical Higgs field for, um, for the entries in the operator. Uh, then we will need to connect them by one loop and so on and so forth. And uh, it's really a very simple calculation to check that uh, we reproduce the result, the, the part of the exact result expanded in, in, in lambda. So if we do this, what we get is this expression. And uh, most part of it is just a normalization condition for the operator. So this pi square root of lambda, this is just normalization factor. Because the field of the monopole is, is very simple, it's just uh, 1 over r. Well, 1 over 2 r. Uh, if we substitute it here, this simply cancels this 2, and what we get is the leading term in the correlation function. Then, uh, at the next order, we will need to connect all Ilsen um, <coughs> operator pairwise, pairwise because of the diagram should be planar. So, naturally, uh, this diagram has a symmetry factor L which appears here. And uh, then um, one can check that the limit of the propagator in the monopole field uh, coincident points is, is lambda of 4 pi. And this is the prefactor that we also get in the wave tensor. <coughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so that, well, works. and. Uh, so in a sense, it's just a check of S-duality of it for superior means. We can also um, do a strong coupling calculation. So there, we need to stretch supergravity propagator between, well, bulk to boundary propagator from the boundary of ADS to, to, uh, to a point on the D1 brain and integrate over, over its world volume. Uh, it's uh, well. It's a little bit less trivial calculation, but it also produces the, the right result, uh, which is <laughs> written here. And finally, there is a regime where we weren't able to figure out how to check it by simple-minded calculations. Namely, there is a BMN regime where we take coupling to infinity and then charge to infinity such that th this ratio is fixed. So in, in that regime, we expect uh, string to be classical, but still not equivalent to a point like um, particle that we use here. And the prediction is that the answer is, uh, is a cinch of the of this rescaled charge. So that formula, I don't know how to reproduce. It would be very interesting to, to understand. OK, so. Uh, um, uh, so for protected operators, we were able to uh, find the answer using combining this duality and uh, localization. So for unprotected operators, we 
hope to use integrability. And uh, uh, but so far, what we did is just simplest uh, one loop calculation. So we take, uh, say, scalar operator described by the SSX spin chain <coughs> and uh, substitute the monopole field for each of the operators in, in, in the, in, inside the trace. So what this means is that we need to project the wave function of the spin chain on a given state, which is very simple, which is just uh, uh, each of the, so in the monopole field, the uh, Higgs condensate as a particular direction in the SSX space. So we need to project it to this direction, each side of the spin chain. Uh, so this state uh, is known to have, uh, to be very special. And uh, I believe it is related to the previous talk where in, sp in spin chains, sometimes it's possible to find uh, um, a nice expression for one component of the wave function, which is usually some type, some type of determinant or ratio of determinants. So this is precisely the case here. So what we want to, uh, to compute is one component of the wave function where all indices are the same. And uh, in this case, uh, the answer is known. So it's the spectrum is described by the beta and Z equations for uh, for SO6 uh, and uh, um, uh, the, um, uh, this boundary state has a nice property of, um, uh, of being integrable in the following sense. So if you consider its projections into all possible beta states, then only states which are paired survive. So there is a Z2 um, selection rule. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the collection of the beta roots should be invariant under uh, parity, under changing the sign of uh, the rapidity. And only then the, uh, the state, the beta st eigenstate, has an overlap with, with this uh, boundary state that we find from. Uh, from the monopole. Um, so, uh, and uh, uh, there is a known determinant representation for, uh, for, the, for the resulting overlap. So we have, uh, uh, which was uh, derived in, in this paper, uh, but it has a very well-known form uh, that contains two um, Factors uh, that are look like uh, Gadan determinant, uh, and actually this uh, ratio is is a super determinant of the Gadan matrix. So th there is a Z2 parity involved that distinguishes uh, roots uh, with positive and negative sign, uh, and uh, so once we have Z2 parity, we can always de define a super determinant of a matrix. Uh, so, in this case, the matrix is such that this super determinant can be written as a ratio, as a ratio of ordering the ordinary determinants. And uh, this formula, so the overlaps of boundary states always have this form. So it's a ratio of uh, uh, determinants uh, multiplied by some um, Q functions evaluated at particular values of uh, the parameter. Uh, and so again, in, in this case, this, this uh, um, formula is known. Uh, and indeed, it points towards integrability of, uh, of this setup that uh, presumably there is a generalization of this formula that would include all possible quantum corrections. Um, so uh, if uh, the organizers will put together this meeting in, I don't know, next year. I'll be able to report on this formula, but so far we don't uh, know what it could be. Uh, also, it would be interesting to study larger sectors. 
And in principle, the common law rules that the expectation value of an operator should be equal to G function, uh, also having, uh, typically having a um, uh, representation of uh, some ratio of free column determinants. Um, so this, this is uh, my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Constantine for the talk. I am sure there will be questions. We have plenty of time for, for questions actually. So at the beginning you said you are calculating the supersymmetric Toft loop and then you calculated the expectation value of this protected operator, but still you got some wrapping correction. So how is it possible? Uh, you mean from the integrability point of view? No, I mean, you, you did this uh, exact calculation via the S-duality, and then <coughs> some wrapping correction came out. No? Yes. So a protected operator, and then super it, that is the supersymmetric. Doesn't kill it, that wrapping correction? Well, I mean, it's just an interpretation. Put some function on the company. Yeah. Uh, now, um, you know how the story works for uh, D1, D5? <coughs> and the... Uh, so for D1, D5, the exact answer is known for protected operators. Mm -hmm. If you compare it with your formula that's asymptotic, yes, sure. you get one half of this answer. So there is a tail that is not captured by it. And so this means that there are wrapping corrections. Yeah, but you sh if you would calculate the anomalous dimension of a protected operator, then you would, you would calculate the anomalous dimension and it would be zero because of supersymmetry. Yes, exactly, but the, the expectation value of even of protected operators is not trivial here. Okay. And if, well, it uh, contains some, some, I don't know, picks up some determinant from the vacuum of the spin chain, uh, so which is trivial for, for, um, in the symptotic case, but uh, this, I mean, it is presumably not so trivial in the, in the, in the, when we consider the, in the, the spin chain of point. So, I, I don't know, I, I don't think it's known in detail how it works for D1 D5, but what the um, uh, I mean, here this is just a speculation. So what we have is just uh, it's uh, uh, something <laughs> doesn't work. Yeah, if you go a little bit. Yes. I want to stop. Yes, here. <laughs> so, I don't know, this, uh, for, for the one before this formula, the, both the synthetic part and the wrapping part are more complicated. But uh, what tells them apart is th that the uh, asymptotic part depends on x, a, and uh, the wrapping part is, is a series in 1 over x. So, and in perturbation theory, we can see that uh, uh, the distance between this and this is L, exactly L loops. So it's very natural to interpret one as the wrapping correction. Yeah, but usually in the wrapping, you have some particles wrapping, and then uh, bosons can wrap, fermions can wrap, and then they cancel each other for a protect. Well, for some reasons they don't because of the boundary, right? There's a, no. They scatter off the boundary in some way that's really difficult. I don't know. Maybe uh, that, that Toft line is not that supersymmetric. <laughs> 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 well, it's not supersymmetric enough to have this expectation. Yeah, yeah. What I can say, and that's 100% uh, it's the result of the calculation is that yeah. the one point function is given by this formula. Mm -hmm. now how to interpret this in terms of integrability, I can speculate, but it <laughs> remains a speculation. Let's maybe go with some other question. Uh, Since 
you, you study the formula which you know in all orders of 1 over n expansion, you control at least everything there. Uh, can you say uh, what part of this 1 over n expansion or even exponential corrections will survive on the other side of S-duality? Because, of course, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, wait. Uh, even more money. Uh, be... so it's the opposite direction. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> of course the, there is a formula that's exact that in N and in. Uh, yes, yes, so there is this formula yeah. which. Um, it's exact. You can explain that in one or n. Uh, I guess with some effort one can write to all orders in one, one yeah. over n. There should be some exponential corrections, yes. Presumably there are exponential corrections to that. We haven't started these questions, but uh, there are certainly no means to compare them to anything uh, we know. I mean, how do we... What do we confront them with? Uh, a DCFT duality becomes very complicated beyond one leading order than one over n. Perturbation theory we can do, I don't know, one, two loops, not more. So what... what well, just one over n. You do with this formula one over n. Uh, of course, I, I suspect that any order of one over n will just go to nothing in the other side of S duality. You lose completely. Oh, yes. But uh, maybe you, if you add exponential corrections, then something survives. Uh, if you do, uh. As duality mixes everything. So we cannot, I mean, the, mm -hmm. ex, the larger limit for the Wilson loop is completely different. So it gives you no clue to what would be the correlator of the proof. It's just Sheer sure luck that we have an answer that is valid for pi net n as well. Then we can use this trick. Uh, but, um, S duality is, is uh, really I mean, it's a symmetry of non perturbative string theory, so it's not, not clear how it, how it acts on, uh, on spin chain states and so on. But the whole expression. Has some some counterparts uh, after S duality as you show us, but uh, the whole expression can be expanded in one over n. Yes, it's, it's an interesting question to, to see what to see how they mix. Yes, the and, uh, I I would expect that it has that it's an asymptotic series in one over n that there is no radius of convergence. Because maybe it would be interesting to study. <coughs> But these questions have been, it's not related to what Kostya is saying, that this is duality, recently there was some progress related to these integrated correlators. So there's an explicit example of observable group of theory, which is for correlation function integrated with respect to one of the points in a certain way. If you function, you function of GP and M, which supposedly have to be S invariant. And if people did check that it's S invariant. Yes, yeah, so I should say that. Uh, uh, that um, for Wilson and Cook loops, this was done long, long, long before. So for the expectation value, what I showed uh, is not our original result. It's, uh, it was done in this uh, uh, okay, so we just can refine it to two functions. So it is true that as duality is, is a symmetry, we, we can see this very explicitly. I have a kind of stupid question. So uh, monopole, the charges of monopole, quantized in the world's uh, young mill charges. So in other words, v karmic expansion corresponds to the strong karmic expansion of the monopole. Uh, v karmic expansion? Ch ch charge of the monopole is inverse to the electric charge. So if, I, if I'm starting with Young Mill theory and I'm looking for the Chachos monopole, uh, do your quantization tell me that the Chachos monopole should be inverse to the Chachos electric yes, yes. 
So which means that uh, the coupling expansion, small lambda on each series side, corresponds to the large coupling to monopole. And vice versa. Um, natural, natural units, by the way, <laughs> the monopole charge is just an integer. Like, it, it's the question where you write g squared in the action or in front of the action. Let's, let's okay, even write a young mill theory. You specify what are uh, electric from magnetic charge of the particle. Yes. So if you write it in front of the action, one over g squared, yes. then monopole is quantized in, in integer units. If you insist to writing it inside the covariant derivative, then, then uh, this, which is how usually direct quantization condition is. Well, but this it this doesn't change uh, what I'm trying to say. That, uh, if I, uh, it seems like what diagram you have shown, you're quantizing your theory and the background of particular classical solution is monopole. Yes. yes. My question is, and, and the diagram you have shown, there was no any quantum correction to, mon to this monopole per se. Another way, you're talking, you were looking for the semi classical population where you're saturating it scalar field by a monopole solution. Yes, yes, yes. But there was no any quantum fluctuation of the monopole itself. Which part of the effective action of a monopole? Um, my question is, after you, if I will be quantizing systematically my theories within it of the monopole, in which regime I am uh, located corresponding to the values of lambda? So is it three coupling regime or strong coupling regime? And what are the corresponding values of lambda for each of the regime? Because my understanding is that one of the main calculation in all this for this monopole is exactly that, that if you're staying with a perturbative regime for electric particles, you're in a perturbative for monopole. Step two. And then you're stuck. But you seem saying something more about it. Um, well, I don't know. Here, the setup is that we have one monopole which, which is static. So it's not like, it's a response of uh, normal electric particles to one big static monopole. Mm -hmm. But particle react also on monopole as well. Yes. So my question is this reaction, is it small or large? And small large, how it correlates to the The product of electric and magnetic charge is one. So if one is weak, another should be strong. Yes. That's why I'm saying that if I have to do expansion within the monopole, it goes to with some assumption, something is small. What is small? But I think it's now clear enough, and we had a long discussion already. You said monopole charge to be one. Yes. This formula. Yes. What happens if you restore this unit? It will be one over. Yes. So it is. But does, yes, it but is this is his question. But does it change? So what better than that change? Where is this monopole charge? It's essential parameter. Put it one. Put it one. Put it. But if you put it three half, where does it appear? How does the spin chain change? Ah, okay, okay. So. Um, Question I don't know the answer because uh, you don't have this parameter. In principle, it's possible, but the tools that we use are simplest for for the sedimentary. Otherwise, we would have need to use Wilson Lobson higher representations of the gate flow. The tools there are known, but a bit more complicated. So spin chain will significantly change. It significantly depends on the chosen representation, right? Yes. It's not just a parameter to play with. It's a diff entirely different chain. Um, I suggest to go on with the program.